their kit for resolving mixed biological forensic samples as well. The cell selection and sorting is done upstream using images and immunofluorescence. Uh, and this is a nine channel instrument. So as I said, your starting material can really be anything you can dream of. We have individuals across the United States using this instrument in zebrafish, in pollen, in cancer, in um, neurodegenerative disorders. Really, as long as you can get single cells out of it, you can put it into the Debra and sort it. The sample prep, all it really requires is that your cells are fluorescently stained using a fluorochrome that the instrument can detect. This can be from some of our workflows, uh, the cell search and cell mag are tools that we make for analyzing circulating tumor cells out of liquid biopsy samples, FPE, forensic samples, or again, anything you have in your lab. And the analysis, uh, sample scan, cell selection, and isolation is done in the instrument using the computer, and that gets you the sample that you want. The configuration of the microscope, we have two. There's a five color and a nine color. What you can see is that the nine color is really an expanded filter set on the excitations of the five color. And the names here are examples of dyes which fit into those filter sets. These are also how they're referred to within the internal software, but these are not exclusive. As long as they're within the excitation and emission, you can use them on the instrument. What does the workflow look like from a 10,000 foot view? Uh, basically, you stain your cell suspension that goes into the Depuray cartridge. The cartridge then goes into the instrument itself. From there, these cells are put into the middle chamber, trapped and imaged. From the image gallery, you then pick the cells that you want, tell the instrument how you want to isolate them, and they come out the other side 100% pure. And this can be either single cells or pools of identical cells as well. The magic happens really within the Depuray chip. And this is what it looks like. This is actually uh, the current version of the Depuray chip. You can actually see the onboard microfluidics, but the center here is where the capture and imaging takes place. The center here is actually plated with electrodes and that allows us to grab the cells using dielectrophoresis and hold them in place. That is where they are imaged and that is where the rest of the handling goes. And we'll walk through that stepwise. So how does this work? So the semiconductor array on the bottom of the chip are 300,000 electrodes which break down into 30,000 cages as we call them. It's not a physical cage, it's a single negative electrode surrounded by eight positive electrodes. And then there's a row of positive electrodes that we keep between what we would call a cage, basically to make a lane to move the cells up. So how do the cells move and how does this all work? So this is a top down view of the cell in the middle of the cartridge. Here's a cross section. So we have on the top, we have a negative charge across the bottom. We have alternating arrays of charges. And so this is a, basically a microelectron force diagram. And you can see this area that's dotted here, we're sort of an area of least resistance. This would be what we would call a death cage. So as we apply charge to the bottom of the microarray, the cells will actually settle into this area of least resistance. This is useful because we can individually control each electrode, which means that if we want to move the cell, we just move the area of least resistance and the cell marches happily along. And this allows us to identify and move individual cells for recovery. So it looks like this. First step, cells are injected, trapped, and imaged. The image data sent to the computer, all of the parameters, both uh, um, morphological and fluorescent are sent to the instrument. You can draw your gating. I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. It's very much like flow in that regard. You pick your cells of interest. Those get moved to a parking chamber. It's basically to hold them in place. And then from there, they're moved to recovery where they are recovered by a microfluidics. And as I said, this can be done in either single cells or pools of like cells. So depending on your needs for input starting you play a facet material, protein material, whatever it is, your, whatever analyte you're looking at, whether you need singles or pools of like cells, this is a way to do it. We're gonna skip this slide. All right, so what can we do with this? I mean, obviously it's very powerful, it allows us to get an extreme resolution on individual cells. How does that actually work? 
Well, it works like this. The chip, once the cells are all trapped, is scanned by the onboard fluorescent microscope. All particles, basically anything, is given a region of interest identifier, and then all of the parameters that the instrument can capture, so all of your fluorescent parameters, as well as morphological data, um, are captured and assigned to this ROI. That data is then fed into the software, which is called the cell browser. There are three sort of main parts of the software here. First here is the grid view and data uh, visualization panel. This is the numerical grid version for all of the data that is collected for every particle. And this is basically how you're looking at it. If you've done flow, if you've done traditional cell sorting, you're pretty familiar with this. These dot plots look exactly the same on the debris. So you can put your intensities on your axes, pick the cells that you want. Uh, there are also, of course, histogram views as well. So this is how you can pick the cells that you want. This is the what we would call populations and groups panel. This is really where we tell the software what cells we're interested in and how to get them out the other side. And then, of course, this is really unique. Upstream of any of this, we can actually look at all of the channels that are collected and make sure we're getting the cells that we want. So we have an upstream pick of our cells of interest before we go to isolation. And this can be really useful because if any of you have looked at cell suspensions, they're messy. If we look at, these are examples from the instrument itself. If we look at these top three, we can see we have cells in them. This one on the top looks like it may have a second cell of some kind in here. This one, we've got some APC staining uh, schmutz on the surface. This one has a dark occlusion, which we can see in the bright field. So these would not necessarily be good candidates for recovery because they don't look like they're actually by themselves. However, if we look down here, we see a nice, big, healthy, round, single cell all by itself. So this guy would be a perfect candidate for single cell recovery to minimize background. So what can we do with this? How can the Depore be used? So I mentioned um, one of the other things that my company does is circulating tumor cells, but this could be extrapolated to any rare cell in any biological sample. CTCs are just a good example of that that we're familiar with in MSB. The workflow for CTCs, Start with a blood, uh, blood sample that's put through an enrichment and enumeration on our other piece of equipment called the cell search. From there, the cells are removed, put into the depurator. They actually make a really cool little, uh, we call it the toaster. This is a machine that does automatic supernatant removal on extremely precious samples using centrifugation. It's very cool. And then, of course, we have uh, full genome amplification and library prep downstream. So, starting from blood again. Sample enrichment method staining, have to stain the cells. From there, that's put into the depore. You have chip scan, cell selection, cell isolation, and then downstream, your molecular analysis of choice. You absolutely do not have to use our molecular analysis for this, but we do make a low pass genome kit that boasts the highest or the, the best allelic dropout on the market. And that is the Ample 1 WGA kit. The uh, extremely low allelic dropout for a single cell is actually accomplished because it uses a restriction enzyme, MSC1, to do fragmentation. This gives us a place to land our library construction so we can get effectively or very, very close to every copy of a gene in a cell even when we're dealing with one cell. Depending on how your library has come out, you can either go into a low-pass kit. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but we also do have a targeted next-gen sequencing kit as well. Again, you don't have to use our kits these are just the examples that I'm going to be showing you today. So if you actually do this on CTCs and you use the Depore to sort cells, what can you learn from this? And that's what this is. So here is an example of what copy number alteration looks like on a CTC sample from a patient where we compare a normal cell to a tumor cell. And so these are uh, CTCs that are cytokeratin positive, CD45, <clears throat> Negative DAPI positive, these guys here. Uh, please do not ask me why it is that my company likes to stain DAPI purple. Could not tell you. It is a holdover from the Cell Search Instruments initial designation of false colors back when it was invented in 2004. It's a little unusual. Bear with me. So, if we are able to sort the normal versus tumor, uh, and if, if any of you have never seen one of these low pass diagrams, what we're looking at is basically chromosome position, chromosome 1 to 22, and these. Marks on the side above or below would indicate a loss or gain of copy number in that region. So this is a low pass sequence with a thousand base per window. This allows us to get 
gross ideas of highly generalized genomic insult. Normal, we should see basically everything right around two. In the tumor cells, however, in a single tumor cell, we can see these huge areas where there are um, expansions and deletions all across the genome. And these are the data from single cells as well. So this allows us to actually get to what's happening in the heterogeneity within the sample from a complex mixture of cells. In a more um, complicated use case, there are cells in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, which are called Hodgkin and Reed Sternberg cells. These are extremely rare cells. They're very, very difficult to find and isolate. However, using the Depare, and in this case, the, the markers that were used to identify and sort were CD30 and PDL1. So using the Depare, we were able to isolate both normal and HRS cells from the same sample and look at the CNV profile. And so that's here. So in D, we have the CNV profile of what we'd call bulk. So this is just the sample put into the same low pass sequencing. And E and F are leukocytes or HRS cells. What's interesting if you look in D is it looks almost exactly like the sort of leukocytes. And that is because the HRS cells are so rare that if you do this sequencing in bulk, there's way too much background from healthy cells to be able to detect the mutations and aberrations in the HRS cells. However, if you compare D to E and F, E here, which is our sort of leukocytes, these should be healthy, normal cells, a great normal profile. But because we've now sorted out the HRS cells, we can now get a comprehensive picture of the copy number alterations across the genome in the HRS cells, which was lost when we tried to do this in bulk. So this is really the power of being able to isolate, capture single individual cells of interest from a complicated biological sample. And you know, just to wet your whistle a little bit more, this can absolutely be done upstream of single cell RNA-C. This paper from 2018 looked for cancer stem cells in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, I'll leave the citation up, but the short version of this is that they were able to use CD133 and CD24 sorting of a depare to isolate what they called hepatocellular carcinoma cancer stem cells for RNA-seq downstream. So the technology is extremely powerful. I wanna give one other use case and that's the ability to use this sorter for FFPE samples. The workflow for that, if you've done any FFPE work, is not terribly dissimilar than staining cells that are FFPE, or sorry, staining slides that are FFPE. There's a prep, which involves deparaffinization, access to the antigens there, but there's also a disaggregation step to get single cells. From there, sort, we can get tumor and stromal cells, and go into light, uh, library prep, sequencing, and analysis. We did publish this method in this particular paper uh, from 2016, uh, goes into looking at the ability to analyze a wide variety of FFPE specimens. And I wanna, don't focus on each individual line here, I'll point out sort of what the important things are here. These are all different kinds of samples, different tissue type, where they came from in their IDs, and tumor cellularity. This is really, a challenge when trying to get nucleic acid information out of FFPE samples, because unless traditional work, unless your samples are above about 20% tumor cellularity, you won't be able to detect the tumor genetic signature on the high background of the normal genetic signature. And so we actually were able to take this sample here with just a 5% tumor cellularity. And we were able to take samples that were basically brand new, but we also did some analysis all the way out to look to see if we could use this on archival tissue as well, all the way up to 21 years of age. And for those of you who've never seen an H and E stain of what a 5% tumor cellularity sample looks like, it looks like this. The area is labeled with T here. These are your tiny patches of tumor in a sea of stromal cells. And so if you were to try to bulk sequence this, you would never find the tumor signals. You would not be able to understand what mutations were present in that. So next step here, basically walk through this. Deparaffinization, aqueous buffers, these cells are then disaggregated. They are labeled. Uh, in this case, our kit actually stands for anti-keratin, anti-pimentin, and DAPI. And again, this is open. If you have FFPE samples, and markers, you can use whatever you want here as long as they're fluorescently tagged and compatible. 
There's also a quality control kit because ideally you want to be able to sort these cells and put them into sequencing downstream. FFPE is nasty on genetic material. It's an extremely harsh process. And so this QC kit gives you an idea of if you're even going to be able to have high enough quality DNA to go into NGS. And so this is a really helpful first step so you don't end up spending the money on a sequencing run and then getting nothing out. A um, couple of things to, to keep in mind, you can't do this off of a tissue slide. You actually have to go back to the original block and then cut a thick scroll. And the reason we have to do that is to get whole cells. Dielectrophoresis, the sorting property that we use, requires intact particles. So if we don't have whole cells, we can't sort. So just have to cut a thick scroll, and then you can go through this and do NGF. Process is nearly identical. Just aggregation and staining, load into the depth array, find the cells you want. You pick out your stromal and tumor cells and do those either single or in bulk. Now I mentioned, this is an example of what it looks like to do this with our kit where we have Vimensin on one axis and keratin on the other. This of course is Alexa 488 tagged anti-keratin and Alexa 647 tagged anti-Vimentin. Uh, Vimentin stains our stromal cells, keratin, will stain the tumor cells, which are at epithelial origin, so they do express keratin. So we have our single positive cells here, our double positive cells here. We even have our double negative cells here. And we could isolate as many as we wanted of any of these populations up to about a thousand cells if we want. We can actually also use the signal intensity from the DAPI to do a rough estimation of DNA content in a cell, as cancer cells especially accumulate large deletions or especially expansions, you can actually see the signal from the integral DAPI intensity shift to the right because they have more DNA because they have uh, genomic expansions. But again, this demonstrates why this is so powerful. So these are actually, again, as I, as I showed before, these are copy number alteration plots across the genome for pancreas ductal adenocarcinoma. We have our bulk up top, Second row here, these are our sorted stromal and sorted tumor cells. And much like I showed before, in the bulk or unsorted sample, we can see some of the mutational hotspots that pop up here. But when we compare that to the resolution of what we can now see, now that we've removed the background of the stromal cell, we get a much clearer picture of the actual copy number aberrations that are present in the tumor tissue. So this is an extremely powerful tech. And so how low can we go? So how few cells can we do this with? I did mention that FFP samples are notorious for having poor quality DNA, but we have successfully done this with one cell. And I'll show you the data for that. So this is low pass sequencing again of FFP samples. Biopsies are dissociated, labeled, sorted, and then put through our low pass. And these are just dilutions of cells, 117, 30, six, and one. And we see the same CNV profile across the genome all the way down to a single cell from an FFPE sample. So really the Deborah has an unparalleled ability to pull out cells of interest from complex biological mixtures to get you the cells of interest upstream so that you can get the data that you need downstream. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention. And what questions can I answer for you? So the, the average run on the instrument um, can take up to 30,000 cells and the process takes roughly two hours. And that's partly because the cell selection is a manual process. So it's not as quick as something like an automated flow-based sorter, but it's much more precise. So if that's the case, then then also cells so our in in our hands and in, in the experimentation, no, we can actually sort live cells. It says the process is dental and the sorting can be done in media. They will actually be perfectly happy and healthy. There is a live cell application for the Depray Plus, and so we haven't seen lots of cell death in that uh, in the samples that we've uh, validated it in. Yes, and that's an excellent question. So the, the cell size limitation is actually based on the physical height 
of the cell within the cartridge is between 70 and, I'm sorry, seven and 40 microns. We have done sorting with particles as small as four microns, but we don't get reliable movement of them within the depth ship. It can be done, but it's a very clunky process. And so the sweet spot is really between seven and 40. Yeah. So, so we are currently in the process of developing a more comprehensive RNA protocol, but it can be done. And this group did it and their, their protocol is actually available as well. So we do know that it is absolutely possible to do single cell, um, in this case, it was SmartSeq downstream of the instrument. But especially because we have the capacity to do live cell, you can do single cell RNA sequence. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Any other questions? Um, ah, excellent question. <laughs> um, I believe I, I'd have to check with sales, but I do believe that the the base price on the instrument right now is somewhere around two hundred and twenty k. All right. Last call for questions. Thanks very much for your attention, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, please enjoy the food. Bring your labs. There's a ton. Take stuff back. I don't want any of this. I have nowhere to put it. Please feed your labs. Thanks again. Hi. Why are comparing the clocking number? What's the reason you feel that kind of data? What kind of biological significance? So depending on the tumor type, um, copy numbers, copy number expansions and deletions can be very key for understanding areas of genetic insult that drive cancer. And depending on the cancer type and depending on the signature, it can give you an idea of one, sort of what your gross genetic profile looks like. But two, it can also inform downstream and more targeted like SNP analysis as well. Especially in the, the more clinical science space, a lot of that is based on copy number variation because it's a common readout for actual clinical medical mutational analysis as well as done on CMV rather than single nucleotide variation or even things like deep sequencing and actually getting a full de novo genome from the samples. Do you think the uh, so it's easier to analyze copy number compared to like a specific interested um, gene of interest uh, uh, expression? Level? It's it's much more simple. You get a very I mean you saw the plots. They're very yeah. easy to read. You can see where the regions of deletion and expansion are very clearly. Um, it is a faster sequencing process. So it also tends to be cheaper because it's not as deep. Okay. but you don't get the detail of information. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're looking for, which one you would want to yeah. use. Yeah. So have you ever tried like the specific gene analysis? So we have. Um, we actually do make. So we have a targeted profile that we can use for NGS downstream of this, and really the. The only delineator, the only thing that's different is you may need to, rather than sorting a single cell, you may need to get 10 cells so you have sufficient nucleic acid to go into the kit. So that's one of the other things that's nice about the depurate is that if your cells are all stained together and they're all the identical cells according to your biomarkers, you can get just those cells in the pool in a single sample instead of just a single cell. So there are there are absolutely ways to do this down there. The CNV data is just something we have a lot of, so we use that as an example today. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Actually, I, I want to use some single uh, cell. Uh, do you think this kind of uh, uh, do you think this kind of uh, platform can be integrated with the CRISPR screening library? Ooh, so this is a great question. So this is something that I've been thinking about and have been trying to find a good way to pitch to the research and development team internally since I joined the company in 2020, because I do think that there is potential, especially for like low efficiency CRISPR and yeah. especially in genes that are very difficult yeah. to appropriately delete using or CRISPR. The cells, uh, which we don't can, we cannot have enough cells because uh, I talked to someone doing the CRISPR screening, they re for a certain coverage of their uh, uh, the genes, mm -hmm. uh, they need uh, like uh, 35 million cells sorted out from the flow cytology. It's almost impossible. Wow. 
So yeah, so. Uh, I don't know. So that's that's a tough one to get around, and I'm not sure that Debray would be able to do it, mostly yeah. because the big issue there tends mm -hmm. to be you need sufficient material to get appropriate transduction. And they tend to do those transductions in very large volumes in order to give you the chance to get some out. However, it would, like, theoretically, it is possible to do transduction on very small numbers of cells, but it, your efficiency may end up making you run many, many, many unsuccessful experiments. So, um, for example, for the years, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, transcription uh, analysis. So if I understand correctly, so they use your instrument to sort out the cells mm -hmm. and then use another RNA uh, sequencing kit. Mm -hmm. Yep, the, that's exactly right. They use the, uh, the SmartSeq single cell RNA kit. I believe that's a Kaiju product. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, and, at the very beginning, I thought that you are going to do everything in your instrument. Mm. No, it's not really not designed. Yet. It's really designed just to get you the cells that you yeah. want and only the cells that you want. And then from there, it's open ended. Okay. Got it. And that's actually one of the things that I like the most about the instrument is that you don't have to use our stuff. If you have workflows in the lab that you're comfortable with, if you have kits, material, library preparation, that's <laughs> compatible because yeah. all we do is get you the cells. Thank awesome. You so much. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How's your turnout? Not too bad. I'm just with the IT department. Cool. Sure we turn out all this stuff. Were you able to get all everything all set up yep. and situated? Sure here? was. Uh, between between my experience working here many years ago, uh, the fact that I do this for a living, of course, was a big help too. So okay, we good. were good. we had no issues whatsoever. Yeah, it's right pretty now. straightforward. It was yeah. uh, my normal guy that's usually here that helps out with this stuff. Was uh, his they they severed the power line at his kids' daycare, so he got to run out. Oh no! Yeah. All your challenges are gone, so that's good. Excellent. <laughs> I did tell them to take food for their labs. How many people did you have online? You know, I don't know. Um, I would have to ask Chris for that one. Um, uh, all right, uh, Chris. I'm